What's up guys? I'm Johnny Taxonomy. Uh, today I'm going to be building a new enclosure for my Burgundy Goliath bird eater. Um, my largest tarantula. Uh, she's a female. Uh, species name Theraphosa skirmi. They are the most massive uh, spider on earth along with their sister species Theraphosa blondi. Um, and again I say mass because it is technically by weight. Um, there is a huntsman spider that gets about an inch longer in leg span, but um, I mean up at that size, I don't even know that you'd really notice. This is a much larger spider overall. Um, they can get up to and around uh, 12 inches across, so this is the fabled dinner plate size tarantula. She just molted about a week ago, so now that she's settled in and hardened up a bit. Um, I'm gonna transfer to a new enclosure today. Uh, so this, this is a 20 long, standard dimension. Um, I built a custom lid for it that I'll show you toward the end of this video. I'm not using a regular screen lid because several species of tarantulas will actually climb on the lid of the enclosure and it can be bad for the claws um, at the end of their foot pads um, but more notably a lot of the larger species especially different bird eaters can actually chew on the screen and uh, break the screen and chew holes in it and that can cause rusting and whatnot and more importantly it could possibly damage the tarantula's fangs and so again I uh, made my own custom lid which I will show you later, which is made out of acrylic, just to be clear. So the first step is I'm going to lay a layer of charcoal uh, down at the bottom. Um, this will help a little bit with keeping the soil from going anoxic and starting to smell. Um, so I'll lay some larger chunks in there first, uh, followed by some uh, finer, finer crushed charcoal. Now I'll throw in a bag of the finer stuff. Uh, this is some of Josh's Frog's charcoal. It's nice because it comes crushed already. Um, it's the same as a um, organic, non-treated horticultural charcoal. So you can often get this at a lot of garden stores and whatnot. It will be a little dusty at first. You can um, rinse this before you use it um, if necessary for whatever application. In this case, um, you're not really going to see it and it's not going to hurt. So I didn't rinse it to start. Next thing I'll do is add some vermiculite. This is fine grain vermiculite. Vermiculite serves a similar purpose to the charcoal in that it's helpful in warding off uh, mold and fungus and whatnot. Um, and is vermiculite being a natural mineral, it is also um, beneficial because it has antimicrobial properties um, and what it's mainly used for um, in the hobby is to help retain moisture it soaks up water like a sponge and retains it over a long period so um, outside of this it's usually used in soil as well 
just for gardening, um, both to help aerate the soil because it's a light, real light material. Um, and again, also to help retain moisture. All right, so I put just enough vermiculite in uh, to cover most of the charcoal. Now I'm going to pour enough water over it um, to hydrate it quite a bit. Otherwise, it'll soak a lot of the moisture from the soil. Um, this is a high humidity species, so we'll need it to be relatively moist. Now this water I'm using is reverse osmosis, or RO for short. Um, and this is going to have all the hard minerals as well as chlorine uh, stripped out of it. Um, reverse osmosis water is really useful um, to use for misting your organisms for um, increasing humidity because it doesn't have all those hard minerals in it and excess calcium and whatnot. It doesn't leave hard water stains on your glass or acrylic. So it's really nice because it keeps your enclosure's glass looking clearer, nicer, longer. You can usually pick up reverse osmosis water um, just at your grocery store. Oftentimes the filter that they use in the machines that you refill your five gallon jugs or whatever with um, Oftentimes that filtration system uses reverse osmosis. So I probably put about a gallon of water in there. Um, which for the amount of vermiculite I put in still might not even be enough, but it'll be enough to moisten it uh, significantly. Vermiculite uh, will expand quite a bit when it absorbs water, so keep that in mind. You don't want to put too much in. Um, otherwise, like if you're if you're mixing it, so pre-soaking it, which um, usually is preferable um, and recommended, you'll find that if you put too much in a bowl and add water, sometimes it'll overflow because it expands so much. So something to note there. Next, I'm gonna add some soil and specifically I'll be mixing together some uh, shredded coconut fiber um, in this case eco earth um, cocoa core and that will be mixed about 50 50 with an OMRI certified organic uh, sphagnum peat moss and mixing those subs Mixing those substrates together uh, helps to create a soil that's easier for tarantulas to dig and burrow in. It retains its shape better than just coconut fiber. Um, unfortunately, coconut fiber has kind of a uh, sand-like quality to it almost in that it tends to collapse on itself pretty easily. So first I'm adding a pretty good amount of that sphagnum peat moss, which by the way, uh, just to be safe because um, it's not treated with pesticides or anything, which is great and that is of course what you want. Nonetheless, just to be safe, um, I baked it in the oven at about 275, 300 degrees for a couple of hours just to ensure any... Um, unbeneficial microorganisms or beetle or worm larvae or whatever um, were killed off in it first. I don't want to be introducing any unnecessary guests to the enclosure. Mmm. Hot moss. Now I will add the uh, coconut fiber, which again is just, in this case, is Zoomed's uh, Eco Earth. So this is a 24 quart bag. It's, uh, as far as I know, the largest one that they sell. So 
I probably just poured anywhere from 10 to 12 quarts in there. Now I'll mix it pretty evenly with the sphagnum peat moss. And I'm filling up the enclosure with the soil mixture um, to a overall soil level height of about uh, five to six inches and then I'll give it some contouring and whatnot once I add the hide and everything um, but the reason why I'm giving this amount of depth and honestly you could allow uh, for more depth is that way it's going to give plenty of depth for the tarantula to dig or make a burrow if it would like to. Now this is still relatively shallow and that the depth's only going to be about one third of the overall height of the enclosure. Um, and because um, I've never seen any in captivity make a real deep complicated burrow or anything, they I usually see them dig out some dirt um, and just kind of reshape their landscape a bit, which is common. Um, and for that reason, I'm not adding quite as much substrate. Say if this were an obligate burrower species uh, or fossorial species, uh, I would be adding much, much more um, to give the majority of the enclosure would be filled with substrate. Almost, you could think of it as the reverse almost uh, from a uh, arboreal enclosure. I'm gonna actually mix in a little bit of vermiculite into the soil bit itself. I'll pour a little bit more water in to help moisten up the soil and mainly the vermiculite. Mixing it in real good. Make sure to get it all, the moisture and whatnot, pretty evenly mixed. And you don't want it to be sopping wet. Um, just again, moist. Uh, too wet can be sometimes even worse than too dry in certain cases. This species likes their humidity. Um, anywhere from the at the lowest really the high 60s but more preferably up into the high 70s and even low to mid 80s and Theraphosa sturmi as well as the other species um, is real sensitive in terms of their temperature and humidity requirements not nearly as much as uh, Theraphosa blondi but nonetheless, pretty sensitive in the grand scheme. Now, once you've got it pretty evenly mixed, uh, you'll actually want to start compacting the soil. And what this does is um, it makes it easier to burrow and for the burrow to hold its shape again because you're compacting the soil a bit and it helps to kind of give it a little bit more uh, rigidity or just kind of solid structure in general. Now we'll add the hide. Uh, this is a large piece of cork bark. Um, it's kind of an unusually shaped cork round. You can see that it's uh, concave. This will make for a good hide. Um, the way that I've cut it and manipulated it, um, she will have a few different um, potential entrance and exit points. Um, it also takes up a good amount of area, so it'll help to make a pretty, pretty large hide and potentially give a good amount of structure for a burrow. So 
But it's good once you've got your piece of cork bark position to kind of wedge it in there. And then once you've got pretty much an outline of where it's going to be, I dig, dig it out a little bit underneath just to kind of start the burrow or the entrance at least for the spider. It'll help their transition into the new home to be a little bit more smooth. I don't know if you already saw, but I actually drilled uh, holes into this piece of cork bark ahead of time. And because it's such a large piece, this is going to help to maximize the ventilation going to the piece of cork bark. It can actually um, build up mold and fungus under there pretty easily without it um, being right up next to the soil. In general though, cork bark is really good about uh, resisting molds and fungus and bacterial buildup. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though is that most of the cork bark that you buy at pet stores or anywhere pretty much just comes straight off of the tree at the orchard where they harvest it and it will come with all sorts of beetle and fly larvae and whatnot laid in it sometimes and so just like any wood or bark or anything that I use any natural material like that before I use it in an enclosure, no matter who it's for, whether it's a tarantula or a lizard or amphibian or whoever, I bake the cork in the oven. And you only have to bake it around 200 to 250 degrees. Let it stay in there for about an hour or so, even a little over is all right. You're not going to catch anything on fire. You're not going to start a fire because... The smoke point of wood in most wood-based products is above 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so as long as you don't get the cork bark next to the heating coils that are within your oven, and because obviously those get hotter than um, the overall temperature of air inside the oven, as long as they're not close to those coils, you're not gonna you're not gonna toast anything. You're not gonna start a fire. But I definitely, definitely recommend baking the cork first. Um, add a little bit more soil. Coconut fiber. Now I'm going to kind of mess down the walls of the enclosure both to get some of the substrate dust that had been flicked up to go down and settle. Um, also, more importantly, Anytime, <laughs> anytime you go to transfer a tarantula to a new enclosure, it's good to um, at least mist a portion of one of the walls, um, ideally a little bit more than that, because um, you want to give them moisture for their transfer. Um, it's, it's helpful, especially after like shipping or any sort of travel, but just in general, it's good um, when you switch a tarantula to a new enclosure just for sake of stress. Um, I'll 
also miss the surface of the substrate a bit. And this is going to help for the introduction of the cleanup crew, so to say. And that is the next step is what I'm going to add are springtails and dwarf white isopods. So these are the springtails. You can see them crawling around in there. So springtails used to be classified as just a group of insects. Um, now they're actually in their own own major group. Um, they are a hexapod, which in the most basic sense just means they have six legs. However, they are not part of Insecta anymore. I don't remember the specific name of the group. Um, I'll have to look that up. Anyways, I'm just going to shake out these springtails. Um, put them pretty evenly around the enclosure. Next, I'll add some of the isopods. And again, these are dwarf white isopods. I believe the species name is Trichorina portentosa. And these guys are really neat. Um, because they're so small, um, they're really useful for vivarium setups and everything because unless you are something like a dart frog or other uh, small small amphibian or reptile, you're not really going to even notice these, and therefore they go undisturbed. And here, I'll try and give you a shot. You can see some crawling around right there. Those bigger white ones that you can see here in the shot um, those are actually full-grown adults, so they are teeny tiny. Um, another another word for this group of isopods is uh, wood lice, also called uh, roly polies, um, amongst other things. There we go. There's a few more there. Same deal, I'm just going to sprinkle some of the isopod culture around. I'll just put it where I put the springtails. Now both of these uh, cleaner crew species, the springtails and the isopods, both uh, do very well in both temperate climates um, as well as warmer tropical and subtropical climates. And there are other species that you can get that are better for warmer enclosures or so on. This closure, or this enclosure is going to be kept in the mid to high 70s sometimes as high as the low 80s which that kind of range uh, mid 70s to low and even up to mid 80s sometimes that range is going to be ideal for 
most of the bird eaters really um and especially the more sensitive group like the genus therifosa it's important to make sure that the humidity is retained first and foremost for the spider but also for the springtails and isopods the springtails especially um, they actually reproduce best when there are pools really shallow pools of standing water so say say some water collected in some of the crevices of this cork bark you might find them congregated there uh, reproducing and that's actually how you culture those springtails is um, you oftentimes they keep them just on a bed of charcoal with a really really thin maybe a couple millimeters a little more um, of water for uh, culturing and uh, growing the colony. I'll wipe off some of the excess moisture. Before we take this thing inside. Now I'll actually put on the lid that I put together. It is two panels of 3 16th inch thickness uh, acrylic or plexiglass. Um, in those two panels are held together by one central uh, acrylic hinge and then I just use real thick uh, rubber spacers that you usually use underneath furniture or um, even large aquariums or anything um, as the handles they're pretty low profile um, and all you need is something to grab onto to lift each of these doors um, I drilled a network of holes for ventilation. Um, they're decent size, not too big. Um, and this is going to allow for really good ventilation. Um, it's important to note with Theraphosostermi that while they do need high humidity and higher temperatures, they also need good ventilation. Uh, you don't want the enclosure for them or really any species ideally uh, you don't want it to be stuffy and you don't want there to be poor airflow normally I actually drill holes in the side of my tarantula enclosures this happens to be glass and while I could drill holes in them I don't want to risk compromising uh, the glass and potentially cracking it um, I've drilled enough holes and I've large enough size that it should be adequate not to mention the center seam here is not flush it's a pretty thick gap um, it will be plenty thin so that the spider um, cannot get out and will not hurt itself um, the more important bit here was the the clearance around the edge the this groove that it sits in in the tank the upper frame um, that's real nice and tight um, that just helps to ensure that neither of the panels collapse inward um, this was designed so that I could just have these panels separate without the hinge um, and if I wanted to I could still take the hinge off and maybe put these handles in the center and just lift one panel off at a time but in this case I open uh, one at a time um, and I can actually fold this all the way over to access one side of the enclosure at a time um, for situations like feeding or replacing a water bowl or just spot cleaning. All right, let's take this inside. Okay, so this is my Therophosa Sturmi. I've named her Artemis which means goddess of the hunt, essentially, which, if you don't know, uh, Theraphosa sturmi is a, a voracious 
Theater. Um, they put on a great show pretty much every time. Um, seem to always be hungry. Um, and the only time they don't feed pretty much is when they're getting ready to molt. Like, it's a pretty much a definite sign they're going into pre-molt. And that's how consistently they eat. So, um, I'm going to try and be very careful in transferring her. Uh, she's about two years old, for the record, and she's relaxed right now. Probably... Probably a good um, six inches across, I'd say. Uh, I've got a decent sized hand. I'm not going to put it right down directly next to her, but you can get kind of an idea. Alright, in doing this, I'm going to use a really fine soft uh, paintbrush and I've got a large Tupperware container as a catch cup to help kind of guide her we don't want her falling off this table because a spider of this size um, a terrestrial tarantula of this size if they fall from um, even just a few feet can cause um, bodily harm to them and that can lead to death. The other thing to note with this species is uh, transfers and whatnot. Uh, you need to be very careful. They are lightning quick when they want to be. She is being stubborn. Again, she's only come out of molting about a week and a half ago now. Um, so she's probably still slightly soft, so need to be extra careful. Okay, I got a bigger paintbrush. See if that helps at all. You have never seen it. That is a <laughs> that is a threat posture from Theraphosa sturmi, um, which can be pretty uh, pretty daunting. These, along with uh, Theraphosa blondi, their sister species, are the largest in terms of mass and second in leg span only to a species of huntsman spider the largest spiders on earth and so this to be very clear this is a juvenile female and she is already about six inches across again about two years old
Woo! That was a strike. Please don't flick. So I ended up having to scoop her into that large Tupperware container uh, very carefully, slowly with the lid until she walked in. Um, I don't think I've ever had a tarantula be this uncooperative in terms of a transfer. At least in terms of terrestrial species, arboreals can be a whole other thing. But, anyway, she's in her new home now. Um, you can see. Well, I hope you'll be happier in this. Uh, head. Anyway, they get that name, Burgundy Goliath, uh, because if you see on the legs, um, the real long, large setae that cover um, the lower legs and the abdomen, um, they have a real kind of dark pink, almost burgundy color to them. Um, the rest of the body, though, pretty characteristic to all the Therophosos is this like real kind of rich chocolatey brown the lighting might be obscuring it a little bit and unfortunately she decided to flick a bunch of hairs um, during the transfer which is no surprise these guys are known for flicking I just feel bad because she's got that brand new coat um, and if I didn't mention it or I wasn't clear enough earlier, uh, all the Theraphosas, Theraphosa Sturmy included, have really, really intense urticating hairs. Um, so I actually, after this transfer, I had to go take a real uh, quick shower, um, which is not uncommon. I've also been dealing with these for quite a while now and so my uh, sensitivity toward their hairs has been heightened a little bit um, there's kind of that counterintuitive progression with urticating hairs unlike a lot of other things where with the more exposure you tend to build up more of a tolerance or immunity toward them that does not really follow suit for uh, urticating hairs on tarantulas unfortunately Well, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you're new to this channel, please, please subscribe. Uh, like, share. Uh, follow me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I've got accounts started there now. There's links up at the top of my page in the far right corner on the channel banner. Um, if you click those, it should take you straight to them. Um, again... Uh, any support that you can give, especially via subscription, is really appreciated. And again, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys soon.